Merry Christmas. Thank you. Welcome to Christ the King. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're visiting with us, a very special welcome to you. Uh, We've got the Record of Fellowship books in the aisle. We're not asking you to sign in, but if you are visiting with us and you'd like some more information about Christ the King, uh, you can just make a note in those Record of Fellowship books. Now, let's see. Tomorrow we have uh, Christmas Day service. Our Holy Communion service is at 10 a.m. or you're welcome to join us for that. Um, Let's see. All right, now look, guys, here's the deal. I have a lot of people asking me about my dad, Pastor Terry. It's Pastor Terry. Where's Pastor Terry and all that, right? So here's what's going to happen. Calvary, Lincoln Park, one of our neighboring churches, is kind of between pastors. So they asked dad to kind of help them out this Christmas Eve. And he said, sure, not realizing that the service will be at 8 o'clock, right? So about 9, 10, you're going to see my dad rolling around that corner right there, right? <laughs> and he's going to try to sneak in because he doesn't want to be noticed. <laughs> So yeah, I just want you all to stand up and go, hey, Terry, <laughs> hi, all right? So that's dad rolling on here about 9, 10, 9, 15. Uh, anyway, that's what's going on there. Uh, what else we got? Oh, candlelight service. And so just a reminder that uh, try not to get wax everywhere. And if you do spill wax, spill it on yourself, okay? <laughs> I don't care about you. I care about not wanting to vacuum it up. Um, so just keep, if, you, if it's lit, Tilt the unlit candle only. Tilt the unlit candle only, all right? All right, so anyway, all right, I think that's all that I have. Um, Mr. Bodie, we ready to go? All right, let's do it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a family in Christ to celebrate this incredible miracle of the incarnation, the way in which you revealed uh, the redemptive plan in history and given us the opportunity to kind of relive and participate in that uh, narrative year after year is a truly a gift. And once again, we, we gather, uh, we run to Bethlehem to gather around the manger along with the shepherds uh, to witness the miracle. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, uh, upon this celebration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, 
glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. This is the gospel of our Lord. We gather our Christmas offering. So following our Christmas prayers, we are going to sing the Lord's Prayer tonight. So let us pray for the whole people of God and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, on this holy night, we come before you with awe and wonder for what you have done for us. You have sent Jesus, our Savior, into our world, and tonight we greet him as our newborn King. Please be with us and guide us so that the name of Jesus will always be proclaimed here in this place. And please give us all faithful hearts that in each of our own lives as well, 
the love of Jesus may shine through us and reach out to the lost in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. prayers. Father, we also pray for peace. Peace in our land and all across the world to, and peace in our lives. We pray that you would be with all of our families this Christmas and we ask that you pour down your gracious blessings on, our commu- on this community of your people. Lord, in your mercy. And we ask that even as we celebrate the birth of our King here in this world, you would remind us and point us forward to the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help us to live as your people and send your Holy Spirit to always abide with us and keep us in your love until the day that Jesus returns triumphantly. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto all of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My younger sister, I have to always call her my younger sister, right, is the fourth grade teacher, fourth grade teacher here at Christ the King Lutheran School. And every year she does this exercise around Christmas. Let's see, she takes this picture, as you can see it says, Gabriel visits Mary, part of our text from earlier tonight. And the angel, or, or actually earlier today, the, the angel Gabriel told Mary that she would have God's son. And what she does is she has the kids draw two things. First of all, a picture of the angel. And I guess that tests their artist skills. I'm not exactly sure of that. But the other thing that she does, for a completely different reason, she has them put in either a speech bubble or a thought bubble, whatever that might be. What is Mary thinking? Or if she says something, does she say something to the angel and she wants to do this for a particular reason. Now, what I like about this exercise is two things. Secondly, the reason, which I'll talk about here in a second. But what I really like about it is my sister will show me the good ones. <laughs> They're fourth graders. I mean, come on. You never know what you're going to get. My favorite, this was years and years and years ago. This person has long since graduated, so the statute of limitations has expired. All right. I can mention it. Okay. Um, there's the angel who's up there, and then Mary's speaking, and she's looking up, and the kid just writes, oh, snap. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. This is, full, this is 100% true. 100% true. And so you have to remember that the Annunciation of Mary, I mean, it's a pretty big Christian festival. Christians observe the Annunciation of Mary on March 25th, nine months before December 25th. People observe this in the Christian world. Millions and millions of people will gather around to celebrate the feast of the Annunciation of Mary. And the only thing I can think when I hear, see that picture or think about the event is, oh, snap. Exactly. That's it. And that's been that way for, for a dozens of years. Anyway, it's a long time. So I do like that part of it. But really... I like the reason that she does it. She does it for a very particular reason. Her point is, I want the kids to begin to talk about the history of Christmas, to recognize that Gabriel appearing to Mary, it's not a fairy tale. We're not asking these kids, and we start pretty young here at CTK, we're not asking these kids to believe in fairy tales. I'm sorry, guys, we don't teach fairy tales. We teach facts. And we teach the historical aspect of what God is doing in the redemption plan. And it starts with Jesus of Nazareth, a real man who lived 2,000 years ago, and he claimed to be God. And that's a fact, and it's proven. And he was worshiped as God, and that's a fact, and that's proven. And on the third day, that tomb was empty, and he is risen again from the dead. And you can make a case for that. The resurrection is not something that we believe. It's a fact, and it's proven. I've heard parents say sometimes, you know what, when it comes to religion, I'm not going to tell my kids what to believe. I'm going to let them decide for themselves as they grow up. And I think to myself, that's fine if you're talking about fairy tales. Because <laughs> I did the same thing with my kids. I told my kids basically, hey, if you want to believe in leprechauns and unicorns, that's fine. Go ahead. I'll get you a unicorn for your 16th birthday and you can drive it to school. <laughs> that's a great plan to me. If you want to believe in Valhalla, right, the, the, uh, the afterlife for Viking warriors who die in battle, knock yourself out. Drinking mead with Odin and Thor, sure, why not? Eh, whatever. My oldest, right, my oldest, when she was little, she loved The Lion King. Just absolutely original, right? Loved it. Watched it all the time. And I believe that to this day, she truly believes that at one point there was feline royalty named Mufasa. <laughs> She does, in that he was, you know, met his untimely demise at the hand of his uh, treacherous brother, Scar. She believes that. Huh? That's fine. She can believe whatever she wants. My job isn't to tell them what to believe. You know what my job is as a parent? To accurately and faithfully convey the facts that have happened to them so that they know. That's what I've been called to do as a parent. And that's what kind of this exercise does. It begins to help us to understand that when we talk about a baby born in Bethlehem, this is, these things are true. Our Christian faith is not built on the strength of how, how much we believe. That's a huge mistake. Our Christian faith is founded on what God has done. 
what he is doing and what he will do. And that's what we see in these three angel appearances. To Mary, to Zechariah, also in Luke chapter 1, and then to the shepherds, which we did read about tonight. Let's look at the difference between Gabriel talking to Mary and Gabriel talking to Zechariah. She has word here that she is going, even though she is, there's no way that she should be pregnant, she will be pregnant. And this is because the Holy Spirit will uh, grant her this and God uh, will use her to give birth to the Son of God. Mary asks a pretty simple question, how? How will this be? And the angel does, uh, notice three things here. He's very patient with her. He offers her an explanation. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born to you will be called Holy, the Son of God. He offers her the explanation. And then he offers the example. I find this interesting. He goes out of his way to say, even Elizabeth, your relative, is also kind of participating in this miraculous event that God is working on. So he gives her that example or experience, perhaps. We could call it that too. The explanation, then the experience. And then finally, he gives her encouragement. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary asks, I think a pretty fair question, how will this be? God is patient with her, helps her to understand. Very different than what Zechariah gets. Zechariah basically is, asked, is told the same thing. All right, Zechariah, your wife Elizabeth, she's way past her childbearing years, but she's going to have a child, and this child is going to be the forerunner of the Christ. We know him as John the Baptist. Zechariah says, basically, how will I know this? For I'm an old man, my wife is advanced in years. He says, how can this be? Zechariah doesn't get patience. He doesn't get the explanation, experience, and encouragement. What does he get? What'd you just say? What'd you ask me? Notice, what does Zechariah get? Zechariah gets, do you know who I am? Right? I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Do you know who I am? Do you know my boss? That's what Zechariah gets. And then he gets the punishment. It says he's unable to speak until the day that the, you know, the pachan is born. It's about nine months. Although Zechariah being a guy not, not being able to speak for nine months, is that really a punishment? <laughs> you punish me like that, I'm just like, all right, PJ, you're up, man. I'll see you later. All right. I'll check back in nine months later. Kind of. But in any case, but notice the difference. And guys, I got to be honest with you. I've always wondered why the difference. I don't get it. Why is Mary treated with kid gloves? Maybe it's because, you know, she's Mary. But, but why does Zechariah just basically get slapped around? I mean, come on. And so I looked real close at their response. And what I saw was Mary said to the angel, how will be this? And I I just wanted the Greek verbs there. What is the Greek verb? And it's is. How is this? That's the verb she uses. Basically, how is this says, God, what are you doing? It puts the emphasis on God. Whereas Zechariah says, by what will I know this? And will I know is the Greek verb for to know, gnosko. It's a pretty common word. The point is this. Mary's wondering about God. Zechariah's wondering about himself. I know it's subtle. It's very subtle. But Mary's question basically says, God, you know, what are you going to do? Where Zechariah's question says, how am I going to know? And it just goes, it shows how, sim- how easily it is for us to elevate ourselves above God. How will this be? Could be, you know, translated as Mary saying, wow, I don't understand this. But look at what God is doing. Look at what God is going to do. It it, it puts God up here, and then my ability to know it down here, whereas Zechariah, it's a little bit different. Look what I know. And we have to watch out for that. Because when it comes to the things of God, there will be things that we don't understand. There will be times in which you'll be tempted to say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't think it's fair. And watch how easy it is for I to come up here and whatever God is doing to be there. That's not a good priority. And perhaps that's kind of the lesson that we learned from Zechariah. Whereas Mary puts God first. She doesn't understand it, but she in essence says, God, you're in charge. Okay? I'll try to learn from that. And so we take these two things here. Now we take the uh, appearance of the angels, and we see what we can learn from there, uh, from them, and then we put it all together. They appear to the angels. They're out in their fields. They tell them this good news that today in the city of David, a, a, a Savior is born to you. They know this to be Bethlehem. What do the angels do? They race to Bethlehem. Remember how we talked about explanation? We talked about it, encouragement. This is experience. The shepherds don't sit around and talk about, you know, the possibility of Jesus being born. They don't argue whether or not that really was angels in the sky. They run to Bethlehem. 
They get to the manger side. They experience Jesus. That's what we've been called to do, to experience Jesus. How does that happen? Well, it's happening right now. It happens when we gather around as witnesses to his resurrection. So obviously it happens in worship. It happens in the word. It happens as you remember your baptism. It happens as we take the sacrament, as we receive Holy Communion. It happens as we do the things that Jesus does. Think about that for a second. You experience Jesus day to day when you do what he does. So then you ask a real simple question. What does Jesus do? Well, the first thing he does is love unconditionally. He practices forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Do you think you might have the opportunity to practice grace, mercy, and forgiveness? Have you met people? (laughs) Have you been around any people lately? Will you have the opportunity to love unconditionally? Of course. And as we do that, guys, we experience Jesus. It's a real thing. How about this? One of the greatest things that Jesus does for you and for me is carry burdens. He took the burdens of all mankind's sin to the cross, and there he paid the price for it, right? Jesus carries burdens. That's what he does. Let him carry yours. Try this on. For the next couple weeks, you're on Christmas break, right? You got nothing else to do. Try this on. I want you to do this every day. Because here's here, this is my guess, this is my hunch. My hunch is you might have a burden right now. You might have something in your life that's either stress or it's a crossroads, it may be a decision. You might be carrying a burden or helping somebody else carrying a burden. You can probably identify something right now. I'm just calling it a hunch, okay? Start each day out with this prayer. Jesus, help me carry this burden today. And that's it. Just leave it at that. Help me carry this burden today. When the day's over, say thank you for helping me carrying the burden tomorrow. I'm gonna, or, or today, I'm going to ask you again tomorrow. Do that for a couple of weeks. Ask the Word of God made flesh to help you carry a burden. Now, I'm not saying it's going to magically go away. Okay, we're not Pentecostal here, all right? But I am saying it's going to make a difference. Something's going to happen. Why? Because the Word of God is powerful, and Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. And we're told in the Bible that God's Word is living and active. It is alive. It does things. God says that when His Word goes out from heaven, it's like rain. Rain does not come from heaven without watering the earth. In the same way, God says, my word does not go out into the world and return to me void. It accomplishes the purpose for which I sent it. Jesus is the word of God. Just ask him to carry your burdens for a couple weeks. See what happens. Something will. It has to. That's God's word. That's what he does. That's what Mary knew. Mary knew the explanation. And so do we. We're talking about how God has revealed his plan to us in history. So Christmas is about look at what Jesus did. Life, death, resurrection, defeating death and giving that to us. Look at what he is doing now as he comes to us in his word, in his sacrament, as as we are in his presence even right now as we speak. And look at what he is going to do. One day he promises to return and take us to eternity. That is God's word, just as sure as the Savior being born to us. He is Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand for our candlelight.
Receive our Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.